As I stand here today, I am filled with gratitude. Gratitude for being part of a tale that transcends time, reminding us that even in the darkest of moments, hope can be rekindled and dreams can be reborn. I remember that day long ago as a cupbearer to the king, my heart moved by the plight of my people. I journeyed to the heart of the broken city. The walls that once stood tall now lay in ruins. By the grace of God, the foundation for our restoration had been laid years before with the announcement of a long-awaited decree. King Cyrus, in a display of mercy, allowed our people to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the sacred temple. Under the guidance of Ezra, the devoted priest of God and scholar, the temple rose once more, a testament to our faith and resilience. But even in the face of remarkable accomplishments, not all embraced the transformation. And even as the walls of the temple embraced the skies, the walls of our beloved city lay in shambles and needed to see their own restoration. We toiled tirelessly, rebuilding our city's defences, and through the resiliency of our people, we saw them restored once more. So my heart is filled with gratitude. In the end, I realize this everlasting truth. Even when God's people have forgotten Him, He has never forgotten us. Church, welcome back to uh, week three of our series, <clears throat> Rise Up and Build. We've been exploring the lives of three Old Testament characters, uh, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Now, last week we finished with Zerubbabel. Uh, today we're going to look at Esther, and next week we're going to finally dive into Nehemiah, which will be the bulk of our series. Um, each played a significant role in the restoration of God's people from exile. Zerubbabel built the temple. Nehemiah will rebuild the walls, and Ezra, Ezra's going to lead a revival amongst the people of God. He's going to rebuild the people, and by the time we get to Ezra chapter 10, the people of God are coming forward, they're confessing their sin, they're recommitting their lives to Yahweh God, they're desiring His presence. Now, how did that happen? Well, by the end of the message today, I hope that you will see that revival requires the movement of God in the heart of His people. Revival requires the movement of God in the hearts of his people. In fact, if you follow the news over the last year, you know that um, people said there was a revival happening on the campus of Asbury University. In fact, Christianity Today reported that revival began at a chapel service on February 8th earlier this year. A guy named Zach Merkrebs, the assistant soccer coach, was preaching about becoming love and action from Romans 12. And he stated... He told the students, basically, uh, who are required to attend three chapels a week, that he wasn't aiming to entertain them. He didn't want them to focus on him. He, he said this. He said, I hope you guys forget me, but anything from the Holy Spirit and God's Word would find fertile ground in your hearts and produce fruit. Romans 12, that's the star. God's Word and Jesus and the Holy Spirit moving in our midst, that's what we're hoping for. And then he went on to talk about the love of God and his power to transform lives. And he went on and on and preached his heart out. And eventually he called people to come to the stage, but nobody came, uh, at least not at first. And so Zach McCreeb felt like he failed and he was convinced that he totally whiffed. In fact, he texted his wife, latest stinker, I'll be home soon. Well, a gospel choir got up, they sang a closing song, chapel ended, but 18 or 19 students stayed behind, sitting in several clusters around the chapel, some on the wall, some on their seats, some on the floor, and they prayed, and, and they kept praying, and they kept praying, and they kept praying, and, and they, they, they were worshiping, and they didn't stop praying and worshiping for two weeks, 24 hours a day, just worshiping, worshiping, people were 
Students were coming back to the chapel. People were coming from all over the country. In fact, uh, there was an estimated 50 to 70,000 people from all over the country that came to see what was going on with this movement of God. Well-known Christian leaders even came to the altar and they were prayed over. And if you were a well-known pastor who came to the church, you were reminded there's no celebrities here, no superstars except Jesus. Now, some people were skeptical about this event, but professors from the campus claimed that, that they saw a work of God happening here amongst the students. And what's amazing is that in the news, there's been, there's been reported similar events occurring at other universities. Most recently, there was a, about 120 people baptized at a revival event at Texas A&M. Could it be that God's doing a work in the hearts of the next generation? Is God sending a revival of some kind? Could it happen? Well, in Ezra's day, and in our day, it's the work of God through the Holy Spirit. Ed Stetzer and Tom Rayner make this statement in their book, Transformational Church. They say, there can be no renewal, revival, or rebuilding without a vision for and an experience of the all-consuming, all-illuminating presence of God. In other words, if you want revival, you need to hunger for God. You have to desire Him and His presence before anything else. How does that transformation happen? It starts with the architecture of our heart. Revival is an inside-out event. Now, let me ask you a question. When I, when I say the word church, what's the first thing you think of? Uh, many times, the image is, when I say church, the first image that flashes in your mind is that of a building. Over the centuries, people have spent an enormous amount of time and energy and resources constructing church buildings. Do you know where the, church, the word church came from? If you read the New Testament, the Greek word for church is ekklesia, which literally, literally means a gathering of the called out ones of God. The ecclesia was a movement of God whose hearts had been transformed by Jesus Christ. Now, the word church comes from a Germanic term, kirche, and it has, been, it has a different meaning than ecclesia. Kirche refers to a specific location. Ecclesia is a purposeful gathering of people which can occur anywhere. And I want you, what I want you to notice is this. If I say the word church and the first thing you think about is a building, you're missing a foundation, foundational biblical concept. Because the church is really about the ecclesia, the called out people of God, worshiping their creator, fulfilling his mission, living in community for his glory. In other words, the church is not merely a building, the church is about the people. And that's not to say that buildings are not important tools. In fact, many growing church plants long for a permanent building to worship God. My point is buildings don't transform lives, they are merely spaces for ministry to happen. Excuse me. Now, after the exile, Zerubbabel is the first to lead the people back from Jerusalem. And he builds what? He builds the temple. He builds a building. But we learn that that's not enough for full restoration. God must, God's people must be transformed from the inside out. And that's where Ezra comes in. Sixty years after the temple is rebuilt, Ezra brings a second wave of people to Jerusalem. And his focus now is on rebuilding and reviving the people. So here's the tension I want you to feel today. Church architecture means nothing without heart architecture. Churches that spend all their money on maintaining and upgrading their facilities but do nothing to develop the spiritual lives of their people, those buildings are eventually empty. How many of us have walked into a beautiful old mainline church and there's 20 people sitting in, in, in the sanctuary? In his autobiography, Be Myself, Warren Wearsby writes about his first church building project as a young pastor in Indiana. And, and he was questioning the architect about the design plans. And the architect simply replied and said, Pastor, the building you construct reflects what a church is and what a church does. <coughs> the outside and the inside must agree. The outside and the inside must agree. Again, do you know any beautiful church buildings with dead people inside? Church architecture is about a building. Heart architecture is about people. And if we're honest, the former is easier. It's easier to work on a building than work on people's hearts. Because people are messy, right? You probably know this. Church, uh, change does not happen quickly. Confession of sin and forgiveness and, and surrender to Christ, they're really difficult. But, but that is where true revival happens. It happens in the hearts of people. To rebuild the people of God, the Holy Spirit has to be the architect. Transformation of the heart is about showing others the work of God in our lives. 
Does the outside of our church match the inside? Is God blessing the people and not just the building? And that's the message in a nutshell of Ezra chapter 7 through chapter 10. It's a story of revival. Ezra's mission was to reconstruct the heart architecture of God's people. And so I'm entitling this message, Second Wave Spirituality. Because I believe that many of us need a fresh spiritual move in our hearts. The first wave rebuilt the temple, but that's not enough. We dare not be content with our buildings if our hearts are not revived. So what are the components of second wave spirituality? Well, the narrative in Ezra 7 to 10 outlines three. First, you have to love the wog. Second, you got to trust the hog. And then third, you have to seek the fog. Now, those acronyms will make sense as we move along. But I would just ask, are you ready for the second wave? Let's pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would come and you would speak to our hearts today. Change us, transform us for your glory, for the sake of the gospel. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So church, do you want revival? You have to love the wog. In fact, let's say that together out loud. Love the wog. Now, second wave spirituality, first and foremost, happens by loving the Word of God, the WOG. Revival occurs with a renewed focus on God's Word. Now, just to be clear, we believe that the WOG, or the Word of God, revealed to us today is captured in the 66 books of the Old and the New Testament. It is God's special revelation, His love letter to His people. It reveals who He is, what He's done, how, should we, how we should live in response. Now, I recognize there's various levels of spirituality in our audience. Uh, Some of you have been Christians for many years. Others are just starting out. Some of us read the Bible practically, periodically, out of duty. Others of us read it uh, every day with a hunger for it. So when I say you must love the Word of God, I'm talking about the Bible transforming your affections. The Bible must be something you crave because it offers answers to all your deepest questions. By reading the Bible, you fall in love with the God behind the Bible. And that was true of Ezra, the priest. So we've been studying this book named after him, but for six chapters, we haven't met Ezra. Well, in chapter 7, that changes. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, this Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a skilled scribe. Uh, uh, in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given, and the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. So finally, we meet Ezra. Here he is, and in just two verses, we learn quite a bit about his background. So let me highlight a few elements. Number one, look at that phrase, now after this. That's a transitional statement from chapter 6 and the completion of the temple. And and these words are, are a are a bit of an understatement because now after this catapults us 60 years into the future. It skips over the events of the entire book of Esther and plants us in 458 B.C. during the reign of Artaxerxes I. It's a big time period. And we get no details about how the temple is doing, what's happening with the people of God in Jerusalem, or if they were still following God. We're going to learn about that a little bit in chapters 9 and 10. But Ezra takes center stage. And two questions are answered about his life. Number one, who is he? Well, he's a scribe, meaning he knew God's word and he was skilled. He was a good scribe. The hand of the Lord was on him. In other words, God is with him. That's a, that's a phrase that's repeated a lot in the first couple chapters here. What is his role? He's living in Babylon and he's about to ask the king if he can return to Jerusalem with his people. And the king grants him the request to go up from Babylon. If you read verses 7 and 8, Ezra tells us which people he wanted to bring and when they were to leave Jerusalem. But more important than any of that, when you get to verse 10, we read this. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. So since Ezra's the author of this book, this is a self-reported statement. He's telling you a bit about himself. He's sharing his heart with you. And what do you learn? You learn that Ezra loves the wog. For him, it's likely the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, which have been completed at this time. He's got them. He's studying them every waking moment. He seeks to live them out and teach others how to live. Or put a different way, Ezra is in the business of heart architecture. 
He's called to build up the people of God. This one verse offers some rich applicational points for us. What does it look like to love God's word? And in that one verse, there's four components. And I'll just put it this way. Number one, loving God's word means it moves our emotions. It captures our affections. Other translations say Ezra devoted himself to study. He dedicated all of his life to learning God's word. It was on his mind when he went to sleep and when he woke up. Has God's word captured your affections? An affection is a fondness for something. When you wake up in the morning, do you, do you see your study as something you have to do or something you get to do? Does it move you? Second, it stimulates our intellect. Our study expands. When we love God's word, we want to go deeper in understanding God's word. And that may mean you join a Bible study or a small group. There's a number of options here at NBC. Or maybe you're even called to take graduate level classes. If you love someone, you want to know more about them. What's your level of study with God's word? Third, it transforms our will. In other words, our lives are changed daily. When you spend time with somebody, they influence you. You start to take on certain shared qualities. And if you love God's word and you're studying it deeply, you're going to be transformed. In fact, I would suggest that the days you don't study God's word, you're different. And then finally, all that leads to number four, where we take action. We're hungry to teach others. If you love God's word, if you're studying it deeply, if it's transforming your life, how can you not tell others? That was Ezra. The word of God exploded from his heart. He had a gift he could not help but share with others because he believed it offered the keys to a flourishing life. That was the sentiment in the New Te- the sentiment also in the New Testament. What does the writer of Hebrews tell us? For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word is living and active. It changes us from the inside out. When we love God's word, the window of our soul opens and God speaks to us. Now in Ezra's story, he felt a call, a burden, to go back to Jerusalem and invest in the people. God makes a way for him to do this. Artaxerxes, the king, issues a decree, and he says this in verse 13. He says, I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go to Jerusalem may go with you. So essentially, return to your land. Go. Now it's likely that Artaxerxes, like Darius last week, helped the Jews because he thought he was gaining favor with their God. That was a common thing with Persian kings. But whatever his motivation was, God used it to help Ezra. And if you read the rest of the the letter in chapter 7, you'll see that Artaxerxes, number one, he, yes, he grants Ezra's request to return, but number two, he provides immense financial resources to help with worship. In fact, if if this was today, he'd probably be paying for all the best sound equipment or the best lights or the, or the, the best, you know, furniture in the sanctuary. He gives Ezra some governing uh, authority. In fact, he puts Ezra in charge of the judicial system. Everybody's going to obey the laws of God in Israel, which, which is just amazing, I got to say. I mean, last week we learned that, that whatever God calls you to, he's going to see you through, and it's happening again in the, in, with Ezra. Right? His life shows us that God is deeply concerned with our hearts, and he wants a, a second wave spirituality to come over us. The foundation of that is love of the word of God. So do you want revival? God's word is foundational. You have to love the wog. In fact, turn to your neighbor right now and say, do you love the wog? That's right. Turn to the other neighbor and say, do you love the wog? We need some wog lovers out there. Amen? When you love the word of God, it reshapes your heart and mind. It gives you a Christian view of the world because you see things how God sees them. Do you have a Christian worldview? Well, Ezra points us in this direction as he finishes the section. Look at verse 27 to 28. He comments, he says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king, to beautify the house of the Lord that's in Israel, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage, for the hand of the Lord my God was on me, 
and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. So Ezra's thanking God for how he's worked in his life. And these two verses uh, offer three components, I think, of a Christian view of the world. Number one, what do we learn about God's power? God is sovereign. Blessed be the Lord. Why? Because he directed the heart of the earthly king. God is in charge and works all things according to his will. Second, what do we learn about God's character? God is merciful. He's extended his steadfast love to people on earth. He doesn't have to do that, but he does. And then third, how does God interact with the world? God is imminent. He is near to us. He's, he's guiding Ezra. He's going to go with him on his journey because when you love the word of God, you're going to see him more clearly. And it offers comfort and guidance in life. It offers purpose. People who don't love the word of God don't see God clearly. You have a distorted view of reality. And it changes the way you live. It changes how you interact with challenging situations. Love the wog, friends. It'll change your life. Now that gets us to the second component of second wave spirituality. And that is this. You need to trust the hog. So don't just love the wog. Trust the hog. Now some of you are saying, enough, Pastor Bob. I will not be doing any hog riding today. And what in the world does this mean? Well, when you love the word of God, you see how God works. What does Ezra say over and over again? He says, the hand of the Lord my God was on me. The hand of the Lord my God was on me. When you love God's word, you'll trust the hand of God. Now, many of us don't do that. But God was guiding Ezra to build his faith. Second wave spirituality brings greater faith in God. Trust the hog, the hand of God. And Ezra needed that because he was about to encounter two large challenges. The first had to do with the journey he was about to take. Now we're in chapter 8 of Ezra, and it begins with this genealogy of all the families who came with Ezra. Uh, it's likely that he led 5,000 people, 5,000 people on this journey, including women and children, from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem. And we read this in Ezra 8.15. It says, I gathered them to the river that runs to Ahava, and there we camped three days. As I reviewed the people and the priests, I found they are none of the sons of Levi. So before starting the journey, Ezra and his people take a breather and see who's with them. It's a time of preparation. And I'm sure Ezra was eager to get over to Jerusalem, but he had a lot of responsibility for a lot of people. And he also encounters a problem. There's no, there's no Levites. And you might say, well, why is that a problem? Well, those are the people who took care of the temple. It's likely that many did not want to leave Babylon because they were comfortable and the journey, the journey was pretty dangerous. But Ezra knows he needs, to take, needs people to take care of the temple. And so he goes and he recruits, recruits the best before they continue on the journey. And God blesses him. Ezra 8.18 says this, And by the good hand of our God, there's the hand of God on us, they brought us a man of discretion, of the sons of Mahli, the son of Levi. Again, there's the refrain, that good hand of God. God is sovereign, God is merciful, God is with us. Ezra knew this because he loved the word of God. Now he's trusting the hand of God. Do you see how they go together? People influenced by second wave spirituality know how to take the truths of the word of God and put them into action by faith. So let's take a, an inventory. Do you trust the hand of God? Because you see, here's the thing. Many of us say we love the word of God. We, we may read it every day, multiple times a day, but when push comes to shove, when we're faced with an actual challenge, do you trust that God will work, that the hand of God will be with you? And if you don't, why? Well, some of us, we don't have a, a Christian view of the world, as we just spoke about. Others of us, we have a difficult time trusting anybody because of life circumstances. And still others, we don't trust the hand of God because we want the glory for ourselves. We want to be the architect of the building. But trusting the hand of God is all about our heart architecture. It may be that God is putting us in a position where we truly have to trust him so we can see the, the, the hand of God at work in our lives. He wants to build our faith in him. And Ezra is about to encounter a major challenge. Look at 821. It says this, then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. 
So before they begin their journey, Ezra tells everybody to fast. Now let me pause and ask, how many of us have engaged in spiritual fasting? How many? I see a couple hands out there. All right. Now I know you fast for blood work or surgery, but have you ever given up something for the purpose of simply seeking God's will? That's what fasting is designed to do. You can give up food for a time. You can give up technology for a time. In fact, would it be harder for you to give up three meals a day or your smartphone for a day? Fasting is a spiritual discipline that can draw us closer to God. This spiritual action is, is, is being brought up because God is taking them on a serious step of faith. Let's seek God's favor, Ezra says. Now, what's he specifically asking for? He's asking about a safe journey. They're, they're moving families and a whole lot of items. It's a big deal. So let's talk about the journey for just a moment because I want, I want you to see why it's a big deal. Number one, uh, the journey was really long. Uh, it's not a short trip. The total distance they would cover was about 900 miles on foot because they had to go north along the river to, uh, to secure a water supply. They couldn't take the shortest route. Second, the route was dangerous. There was going to be robbers and looters along the route who would seek to attack them. Ezra and his people were, were also going to bring a considerable amount of gold and silver with them to, for, to the temple. For example, we read this in 826. It says, I weighed out into their hand 650 talents of silver and silver vessels worth 200 talents and 100 talents of gold. Now, that's just one verse. There was more. And to put that in perspective, one talent is equal to 66 pounds. So in this one verse, we're told they're carrying 6,600 pounds of gold with them on this journey and, and more silver. Now, I'm not a financial expert, although people keep telling me I should invest in precious metals. But if they're carrying that many precious metals, wouldn't it be nice to have like an escort from the king? I mean, after all, he seems to be granting all your requests. But Ezra doesn't do that. In fact, after counting all the costs and praying for the safe journey, Ezra says this in verse 22. He says, For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way. Since we had told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. Wow. Now, just to summarize, Ezra's leading 5,000 people, men, women, and children, on this dangerous 900-mile journey on foot, and they're going to be carrying with them thousands of pounds of silver and gold under the threat of ambush. And Ezra basically says, I'm too ashamed to ask the king because I told him God's going to protect me. Which, you know, probably produces some mixed emotions in the audience because Right here, it raises an important question. How do you balance faith and discernment? How do you balance faith and discernment, right? I mean, this question and scene probably exposed some different personality types in the room because some of us in here are, are big faith people. You might say, well, Ezra's right, right? You just have to have faith that God will protect you. All you people out there who prep and plan, where's your faith? Others of us think Ezra's crazy, right? Just go and ask for an escort and swallow your pride. You're being foolish, Ezra. Now, what's interesting is if you skip ahead to Nehemiah chapter 2, um, we learn that Nehemiah, he's bringing people back also, but he asks for an escort. And all my preppers and planners out there say, that's right, Nehemiah, he's the wise one. He's the spiritual leader. So let's take a poll. Who's on Team Ezra? Where's my big faith people out there? All right, they're more spread out. Last service, they were all on the right side. This, <coughs> who's on team Nehemiah? Where's my preppers and planners? All right, you guys are spread out too. I'm willing to bet there's one person on each team in your marriage. My point is, how do you balance faith and discernment? How do you trust the hog, the hand of God? Was Ezra wrong? Was Nehemiah wrong? And that question gets at the heart of God's providential work in the world. Because I believe God, God works providentially in different ways. Was Ezra wrong? No. He was trusting in what I'll call God's supernatural providence. God's supernatural providence. Because sometimes God may be calling you to trust him, and it just makes no sense to anybody else. Let me give you an illustration. I had a friend who used to take mission trips to China and, and smuggle in Bibles. 
And you know you're not supposed to do that. Uh, and, and if they were caught, they would be cons- there would be consequences. They'd at least be sent back to the U.S. And while they made some preparations, they had to trust at some level that God was going to supernaturally guide them and allow them to pass. And he had, he had a bunch of stories about God allowing them to do that, God turning eyes and God letting his word come through. Have you ever had a, a moment where God providentially guided you around some danger? Because sometimes God is simply calling you to step out in faith and trust that he's going to protect you. Now, was Nehemiah wrong? No, I think he was also trusting God. He was trusting, let's say, God's mundane providence. God supplied protection to Nehemiah because he had an escort from the king. Both can be true, and both can be the hand of God. What is your situation? Are you trusting the hand of God? Now, here's how it worked out for Ezra. Um, the rest of the chapter, basically, they, they take this, this trip, and there's, there's no escort. And what he does is he puts the priests in charge of guarding the treasure, which is kind of like putting the pastors in charge of the, uh, the armored car, I guess. And they travel for four months. They arrive in Jerusalem unscathed. And then they say, we got to rest for three days because that was a long journey. How did God protect them? Well, he recounts the story in verse 31. He says, then we departed from the river Ahava on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes by the way. So the hand, the hand of God was on them. He delivered them from the hand of the enemy. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Hebrew indicates that it wasn't that they were fending off attackers, but rather God was allowing them to pass around unnoticed. He guided them around danger. And then once everything was in Jerusalem, in the temple, they worshiped God. Because however God works, the point is that he needs to get the glory. Revival is about God's glory. And Ezra chapter 8 shows us that God is at work in the heart of his people. He wants to build a second wave spirituality in us by teaching us to love the word of God. But you also have to trust the hand of God. You love the wog and you trust the hog. Now, when we do that, people will look at your life, and they're going to see God working. And when God works in your life, he builds your faith. Do you need to grow your faith today? So we looked at the word of God. We looked at the hand of God. The final final element of second wave spirituality is this. You have to seek the fog. Now, let's see if anybody can guess what that final acronym is before I say it. You have to seek the face of God. Now, i got to tell you, Ezra chapter 9 and chapter 10 are really confusing and really anticlimactic. So Ezra goes and he seeks the face of God, but his actions put us a bit in a fog. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some summarizing, and I will draw out the main points and and offer hopefully a little bit of clarity um, today. In Ezra chapter 9, we learn that Ezra and his people have been in Jerusalem for four months. They're living with the people who came before them. They're tending the temple, and the people are hearing the word of God. But there's a problem. We learn very quickly. The word of God is stirring up conviction in the hearts of God's people, and it comes to Ezra's attention that the people of God have compromised their holiness, and it's widespread. Look at how Ezra 9 begins. It says this, After these things had been done, the officials approached me, And said, the people of (coughs) excuse me, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites had not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. So there's a spiritual problem in the city. And Ezra's leaders approach him and say, This is serious. The hearts of the people and the leaders. The architecture of their heart is broken. What's the nature of the problem? The people of Israel, even their priests, are in bed, literally, with the people of the land. He continues in verse 2. He says, For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race was mixed, has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men have been foremost. So, you see what he's saying? The people of Israel have intermarried with foreign women. 
or if maybe the women married foreign men too. And all these people don't follow Yahweh God. It's an issue of spiritual compromise. And in Ezra's time, this was scandalous. Now, I think it's important to make a few comments. First, I want to emphasize that the issue here was spiritual and not racial. In fact, in the past, people might take a verse like this and use it as justification to forbid interracial marriage. But the truth is, we have examples of intermarriage with foreigners, like Ruth and Boaz, which produced the line of David and Jesus. That was an issue of they, they were both spiritually under the hand of God. Um, but in Ezra 9, the people of God married others that didn't follow Yahweh God. And that was similar to Solomon in 1 Kings. The women he married brought their false worship into the marriage. And the word abominations in verse 1 indicates that is happening here. They're, they're engaging in this false worship. It was a practice that was forbidden in the Mosaic Law, which Ezra is now teaching the people, and it's stirring up something in their hearts. It's clear that God's people were lax in their commitment to him, and he's bringing conviction to the hearts of the people of God. Second, it's likely that the Jewish men of Ezra's day had divorced their Jewish wives and then went and married foreign women, which was a symptom of a larger problem. Now, in Jewish law at the time, divorce was permitted. In fact, the no-fault divorce Jewish culture was something Jesus himself confronted, if you read Matthew chapter 19, very famously. Jesus said, that's wrong, don't do that. You may remember that the prophet Malachi, who was a contemporary of Ezra, writes about this. At Malachi 2.16, he says, for the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in spirit and do not be faithless. See, Malachi is confronting this rampant divorce culture of Ezra's day. So just to summarize, Ezra learns that the people of God are spiritually compromised. They've married women who don't follow Yahweh. And then additionally, they divorce their Jewish wives in order to pursue these marriages. Wow. Well, how is Ezra going to respond? Look at verse 3. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garments and my cloak, and I pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. Whoa. All right, you say, calm down, Ezra. That sounds a bit extreme, all right? You learn there's some mixed marriages, and you're tearing your clothes, and you're ripping out your hair, and you're ripping out your beard. I guess you had some hair to rip out. It's crazy. But at least it's not as bad as Nehemiah. If you go to Nehemiah 13, when there was a problem, Nehemiah didn't rip out his hair. He ripped out everybody else's hair. Ezra was the pastor, I guess. Nehemiah was the politician. They acted a little differently. Now, some of you might be wondering, why is this such a big deal? And the reason this is emphasized and forbidden in the law is because who you marry deeply affects not just your relationship, but your children. And as I mentioned earlier, any foreigner would have worshipped a different God, and so the next generation of children would have grown up confused. The, the message would not have passed on as clearly. The point is, it's serious stuff, and, and the community was sensing it. So if you look at verse 4, more people come alongside. It says this, Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel, because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. So the leaders of God's people start taking stock of the culture of sin and, and, and that has taken hold in their people, and because the word of God is being taught and conviction is coming to the people, the leaders are especially grieved because they've allowed this to happen. And even some in the leadership have done this. So Ezra then seeks, to go, seeks God's face by confessing for his people. The whole rest of the chapter is a confession from him. Look at verse 5. It says, And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and cloak still torn. He hadn't changed his clothes. And fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. See, Ezra loves the word of God. He's experienced the hand of God. And now, in the midst of deep spiritual grief, he seeks the face of God. He knows he's completely dependent upon him, and he knows God's people must be dependent upon their God. The rest of the chapter is this prayer of confession. 
And Ezra's response shows us the important applicational point here, and that's this. Our holiness matters. Our holiness matters. Because you may think your secret sins are no big deal, and they're not affecting the community. Or, or in this case, there, there's some cultural normativity to the practice that's far-reaching, that, that's, that's bringing condemnation on you. The question we have to ask ourselves is, am I spiritually compromised to some extent? And is that preventing the work of revival God wants to do in my heart? God cares about our holiness. He wants us to seek his face, to seek the fog. Now, how do Ezra and his leaders handle this situation? Well, in chapter 10, after praying and confessing and weeping, Ezra and his leaders come up with a solution. And the solution is this. we got to root out the false worshipers. So they gather all, the whole community together, and they tell all the men who, divorce, or who marry these foreign women, they have to divorce their, their foreign wives and have nothing to do with them. In fact, even Ezra gets into this. Look at, look at verse 10 of chapter 10. It says, And Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You've broken faith and married foreign women, and so increase the guilt of Israel. Now then, make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. And yes, you read that right. Now, if you're scratching your head and, and you're, you're thinking, I'm confused. Um, I thought that God was against divorce. I, I, don't, I don't get this. Well, you're not the only one. There's been a lot of commentators that have spilled a lot of ink on this, these chapters over the years. Because the book of Ezra basically ends anticlimactically with a list of all the people who were guilty of intermarriage and how most of them chose to divorce their foreign wives. And that's how it ends. What in the world are we supposed to do with that? Who assigns these passages of Scripture? What does this have to do with seeking the face of God? Well, let me just suggest, for time purposes, this will be a great week to submit questions to behind the pulpit. So if you want to pull out your phones, Pastor Dave was really excited to answer these tomorrow. <laughs> now, we're going we're to take this on. So we, we love bringing in questions. There, there's a lot of nuances and different interpretations as to what happened here in Ezra 9 and 10. I'd love to dive into those, but just write us questions. We'll get at them tomorrow. Obviously, it's a really complicated passage. So what I want to do here is just offer one point of guidance and one point of application. And the first point of guidance is this. Many Old Testament passages are meant to be read descriptively, not prescriptively. In other words, just because it happened here does not mean we should do the same thing. In fact, as followers of Christ, we have letters from the Apostle Paul in places like 1 Corinthians 7, which talks about being married to an unbeliever. And the words of Jesus himself in Matthew 19, elevating marriage, which, which both of them directly contradict what Ezra's talking about here. Those passages are in stories. They are doctrinal teaching. Ezra and his people did not have these specific teachings to guide them. They were kind of going into this trying to figure it out. And again, there's a number of oppor uh, different interpretations on how to understand this, so, so tune in tomorrow. We'll, we'll cover that. Secondly, for application, again, Ezra was calling his people to holiness. And despite his confusing actions, I think this is the big takeaway from the chapters. The people of God were engaged in spiritual compromise. They were disobeying the word of God, and Ezra was confronting them about it. Even though his solution was problematic, he was pointing them to repentance. And if you look at Ezra's prayer and the grief of the people of God over their sin, that's the big takeaway. When you seek the face of God, it he will bring conviction and transform the architecture of your heart. Their desire to love the word of God, to trust the hand of God, was leading them to the face of God where they were convicted of this sin and there was a genuine level of repentance and return to God. So I would just simply ask, where is God bringing conviction into your heart today? Conviction leads to revival. Because maybe God is opening your eyes to a practice you thought was normal, but it's not pleasing to him. Maybe, maybe there's a relationship that needs to be mended. Maybe we've not been seeking the face of God as we should allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction and set your heart on fire. That's revival. And if you feel spiritually dry, start by asking these diagnostic questions based on what we covered today. Do I love the wog? Right? Do I love the Word of God? Because that's how God reveals Himself to His people. 
And if you don't love his word, how can you love God himself? Second, do I trust the hog? Can I say, like Ezra, the hand of God is with me? Because when you step out in faith and trust God, you can see him work. Number three, do I seek the fog? You know, the psalmist, psalmist very famously prayed, Lord, your, your face I want to seek, O God of Jacob, your face we want to seek in this generation. Are you pursuing the face of God? Because when you do, your heart will be open to him in a fresh way. Yes, there'll be confession of sin, but there's also going to be new affections and new motivations. Your life will be different. This is the spirituality of the second wave. Have you experienced it? Love the word of God. Trust the hand of God. Seek the face of God. It's then that your hearts are reshaped and a movement starts in our hearts. So Ezra revolved the people of God for, their, for this work. And he finishes his prayer in chapter 9, verse 15. Ezra prays this. O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. So Ezra reminds us that God is just. He reminds us that we are guilty of sin before a holy God, that we deserve judgment. But he also points us to a larger story. That God, by his grace, is saving a remnant, a people, for himself. He's leading us out of exile to the promised land of his mercy. He's going to give us new hearts so we can follow him. And the truth is, if you're a Christian, it's the same story. We're also guilty. We sin every day. And God will be just to punish us. But he, just as he protected Ezra and his people on their journey, he protects us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. There, his just punishment was satisfied. There, a remnant was preserved. There, our guilt was removed, and we were given new hearts so we can follow him all of our days. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. All are sinners in need of a Savior. And all we have to do is we have to come and confess and give it to the Lord. And when you do that, transformation happens. So I want to close with a story as the worship team comes on stage. And I want to show you the power of God's transformative work in revival. God did a work in the heart of a guy named Owen Roberts. You probably haven't heard of him, but he was a young coal miner in Wales in 1904. Just a normal guy who loved people and loved Jesus, and God put a burden on his heart to start calling Christians around him to listen to God, to be changed by his power, and to live a public faith, kind of like what Ezra was doing. And the Welsh Christians started to heed this call. It led to more people sharing the gospel with outsiders. And so there was an evangelistic and missional fervor that took over the church. Historian Alvin Reed describes the results this way. Listen to this. He says, as God answered this burden, even the newspapers published the results. In two months, this is in 1904, in two months, 70,000 people were converted. 85,000 in five months. More than 100,000 people came to Christ in six months. But listen to the larger ramifications. Judges were presented with white gloves, signifying no cases to be tried. In other words, there was no crime. Alcoholism was halved. At times, hundreds would stare to declare their surrender to Christ as Lord. Restitution was made. Gamblers and others normally untouched by the ministry of the church came to Christ. Lives were changed. When God is at work in our hearts, something happens. And it's not just in us. It starts to spread like a fire. Is God at work in your heart today? Do you want to see revival? You have to love the word of God. You gotta trust the hand of God. And you have to seek the face of God. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. It's foundational, Lord. It's how we know who you are, what you've done, how you call us to live, Lord. And we thank you that you have opened our eyes through the gospel, Lord, by sending your son to die in our place for our sin and awakening our hearts regenerating us, Lord God, that we could see you as you are. If there's anybody in here today, Lord, that doesn't know that, I pray that they would put their trust in Christ so their eyes would be opened and they would have a, 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 a desire, a, a, an affection for your word. Lord, I ask that in Jesus' name that you would do that work. Humble us today, Lord, and help us to see your hand at work in our lives. We pray that 
In Jesus' name, amen.